who is the Gerald I. Landry Fellow for Innovation Insurance. Stewart was recognized for leading task force tips to become an innovative leader in water flow of the world. Right behind these glasses. I don't think I've ever felt like I was preaching to the choir like I do today. <laughs> um, this is all the work that is here because they're at the forefront of innovation. Uh, when John asked me to speak today, I was pretty unsure of what I would say. But I've learned after 10 years of working with Mr. Davies that to say no is futile. <laughs> you just agree and you decide to figure it out later. What made this task difficult was that John wanted us to focus on what would be needed for Northwest Indiana to be successful. I struggle with that because I believe that a big part of our problem is that we think of ourselves too often as Northwest Indiana rather than being the crossroads of America. It is a global economy and we need to think global and not regionally. Well, here we are. It's at that later time. and. Uh, when you participate in something like this, it is, uh, I believe, common for people to feel like, is anything I'm gonna say today matter? Especially when talking about the future and how to plan for it, or even having the nasty to think that we can envision it. But this past week, I was at the TED conference in Canada. I would imagine, knowing the people in this room, many of you have seen TED videos. And I have attended the TED conference for the last four years. And I can tell you that for me personally, it's been the most life-changing event um, that you can imagine. And I realized coming back from there that I don't have to reach all of you, I only have to reach one of you. Because innovation is about sparking something that changes the way a person thinks to a different way of thinking that makes one a new path that takes them to a successful outcome. You can't help but get fired up about the future when you're around 750 people at a TED conference that are hell-bent on creating it. Each of these talks affects the viewer in a very different way, and the discussions afterwards frequently illustrate that. It is stating the obvious to say the world is changing at a pace that outstretches possibly our ability to adapt to that change. The revolution in information technology is changing the way we work, and more importantly, where we work, and therefore one of the biggest innovations that are occurring is in not only how work is accomplished, but the very de definition of what work is, as you saw here, virtual work. My most favorite business book of all times, if there is such a thing, and I don't sound like a geek even having a favorite business book, is Good to Great by Jim Collins. The book teaches many key principles about business. One of them that I think applies the most to today is that the first step towards implementing in innovation and change is to face the brutal facts. I believe the leadership of our region and the people that elect them have to face some brutal facts. We have some very strong points. We don't have mudslides, we don't have forest fires, we don't have hurricanes, we don't have earthquakes. And thankfully, we lie at the end of Tornado Alley. Okay, so we have a bad winter now. <laughs> but we have abundant water, open space, the Great Lakes, access to raw materials, and most importantly, people that come from a long history of making things. And we are located in the heartland of the greatest country in the world. My question is, when will we embrace the industry and opportunity that we have here instead of longing for something different? When will we learn to stop treating the industry that we have been blessed to have as a result of our location as a friend not an enemy. When will we make the industry that we have feel wanted rather than constantly wishing that they were something else that they are not? I believe that we have to face the brutal facts and play to the strengths that we have, not the ones that we wish we had. With the mobility of the information worker, we have to realize that no matter how much we want to attract that kind of worker, we are not going to compete with the beaches of California the mountains of Colorado and the climate of Florida. Our strength is our location, and no matter what information flow changes take place in the future, the fact is that until we develop a teletransportation of goods and services, we need to function in our everyday life. They will still need to be manufactured, and they will still need to be distributed to the people that need them. We are ideally located to 
manufacture, and even more ideally located, to distribute those goods to a nation and a world that needs them. This past week I attended an event where Governor Pence was the keynote speaker and he addressed this very issue. We are at the crossroads of America and we need to start acting like that matters. One of my favorite quotes is from Rick Warren, the writer of The Purpose Driven Life, the only book to be outsold by the Bible. In that book, Rick Warren makes a statement that all of us that are or aspire to be leaders must take to heart and learn how to implement in our daily life. That quote is that leadership is the art of managing disappointment. Leadership is the art of managing disappointment. It takes leadership to make hard choices that are right for the greater good while causing disappointment for some number of people. Leaders have to have the wisdom to determine what is right for the silent majority while resisting the protests of the vocal majority. Minority, excuse me. This is true in business, and it's certainly true in politics. The incredible amount of time and effort that has been taken to accomplish something as vital to our future as the Ileana Express <laughs> excellent example of where we need leadership that can manage discipline. If we are to perform on our slogan of being the crossroads of America, then it would seem to me that we need to have roads. So building to our strengths of location and resources, for me, is where the future for us lies. One other thing I would think has to change is our approach to education. Another TED talk that I would encourage you looking at was done by a guy named Sir Ken Robinson. And in this inspiring 20 minute talk, he chronicles the roots of our education system to England at a time when the English Empire needed cookie cutter trained people to go out to the world and manage a vast empire that was unconnected. Our schools, to a large degree, still focus on this paradigm, cramming a standard set of memorized information into a student. In the age of the internet, it's not about having information. It's about having the ability to make sense of that information. It's about collaboration and building off the ideas of others that help us to innovate. Our methods of education need to fundamentally change to recognize the brutal fact that Google's here to stay and it's only to begin. My wish would be that we could go back in time and strike the phrase alternative education from our vocabulary. As it is understood today by most people, the word alternative is synonymous with inferior. We need to change that dialogue. My belief is that the future is the manufacturing and distribution of goods that our nation needs, and we are at the epicenter of that need. We must put vocational training back on the pedestal that it deserves. Vocational education is not alternative education. It's merely education. It's education that creates a foundation for a career. This focus also has been the focus of Governor Pence, and as we and as parents and educators need to support him as this puts people in meaningful careers. The United States is still today the largest manufacturing nation on earth. Let's not fall for the media hype that manufacturing is dead as its jobs that are created are dead. It's simply not true. But if you tell enough people the same lie long enough, eventually the lie becomes the truth, and the truth becomes the lie. There has always been a place in the world that has cheaper labor. So what? If labor becomes a small enough part of your cost because of automation, that the cost of labor is no longer a factor that differentiates you between other countries, then labor cost no longer matters. The steel mills are a tremendous example that this is true. They make more steel than they've ever made with a third of the people. Automation, and those people are all making more money than they made back in relative terms. So I encourage us all to face the brutal facts, quit wishing to be like we're some other place we're not, and acknowledge those weaknesses and invest in our strengths, because we have many. Thank you.